Unfortunately for inheritance, I use the better example, but when we're talking about composition, I still think that we can come up with something that's useful to demonstrate how it works. We're going to be diving into object-oriented programming, and in particular, we're going to look at composition. Now, many of us, when we're starting out on our software engineering journeys, we are taught inheritance and composition often comes way later. So the purpose of this video, if you're starting out as a junior software engineer, is to get you introduced to composition nice and early. Now, if you're a junior software engineer, then I highly recommend you watch to the end of this video so that you can learn about another skill that you should learn early in your software engineering journey. And right before we dive into it, would love to hear from you in the comments, how many of you as a junior software engineer learned about composition and inheritance around the same time? I'll be curious what people have to say. All right, let's get some diagrams going. So for many of us, when we're learning about object-oriented programming early on in our software engineering journeys, we're taught about inheritance. And inheritance shows you a relationship between objects where you, as the name suggests, inherit from things and are able to get the functionality and properties from the ancestors. So in this quick example that I have on the screen here, you can see that animal is the ancestor and then we have things that inherit, such as mammals inherit from animals and then dogs inherit from mammals and these things are able to inherit the properties and functionality of their ancestors. But when we talk about composition, we're gonna turn this on its head a little bit. So let's talk about some of the key points of composition. So when we talk about composition, the first thing that I wanna call out is that we're going to be taking smaller, more purpose-built objects and then creating more complex objects out of those. So as the name suggests, we are composing more complex objects from the smaller, more simple ones. A key advantage to this, if you're not familiar with it, is something that's called the single responsibility principle. So when we have smaller objects that we're working with, they're generally more simple than these complicated inheritance hierarchies that we could end up creating. And because we have more simple objects, we're able to stick to the single responsibility principle more easily. And the single responsibility principle states that we have functions and classes that are really focused around one purpose or one responsibility. And the idea here is that the more things that we end up adding and the more responsibilities that we give to a particular object, the more complicated it is to work with, maintain, and test. In object-oriented programming, when we use inheritance, we're actually able to override our parent or ancestor functionality or properties. Now, when we're talking about composition, we can still achieve this type of functionality, but what we're not going to be doing is overriding properties and methods in an ancestor, and instead, we're actually able to change out implementations of the different pieces that our object is composed of. So we'll demonstrate this, but I just wanted to call out that we're able to achieve a similar type of behavior change, even though we're not going to be overriding things and using this inheritance model. And while there's going to be other benefits of using composition, the last thing that I want to call out is that it will generally lead to code that's easier to test, maintain, and extend. And of course, people can call out individual circumstances where this argument might not hold, but this is why I'm saying in general, I think that using composition you're able to get these properties more easily than using inheritance. In fact, I would argue most of the time, inheritance, when you get into complex hierarchies, actually makes these types of properties more difficult to work with. So quickly before continuing, here's some of the key points that I've already called out, and I just wanted to add that in general, I found that a lot of us start off with inheritance in the beginning when we're learning about object-oriented programming, but I do really think that composition is a much more useful way to design software. And the unfortunate thing is that many of us, including myself, kind of get trapped in this inheritance style of programming. And sometimes it can take us a really long time to get out of this pattern because this is what we were taught early on and it's kind of ingrained in our behaviors. So with these key points out of the way, let's actually get to diagramming some things that we could use composition for. So the example that I'd like to use for composition is vehicles because I think that this will help demonstrate how it works because there's more tangible pieces that we can refer to. Remember, when we're talking about composition, we're starting with smaller pieces and then building more complex objects out of those smaller pieces. So like with the vehicle, these are composed of more simple parts and when you aggregate them all together, you have something really complex that runs and functions. So what we're not going to be doing is using this type of model like we have for inheritance where we would have types of vehicles that would inherit from the vehicle's ancestor. So we would not be creating classes like motorcycle, car, and truck that would inherit from a vehicle class. This is inheritance. That's not what we're going to be doing here. 
But I think if we write out some examples like this, then we can ask ourselves some interesting questions. So what types of parts do these things have? If you think about a motorcycle, a car, and a truck, literally, what types of parts do they have? For example, each of these would have an engine. Each of these would have wheels and tires. Now, if you think about cars and trucks, these two things have doors. But most normal motorcycles do not have doors on them. And even if you're looking at cars and trucks that have doors, do all of them have doors? Do all of them have the same number of doors? Another question we can ask is what type of functionality does each of these parts have? So for example, each of these three things that I've drawn on here has an engine. What's the engine responsible for? How about the wheels and the tires? What are they responsible for? The doors on cars and trucks, what kinds of actions can those things perform? Personally, I think it's helpful to think about composition this way because we can take real life objects and think about how they are built up from smaller individual objects. A lot of the time in software, we're not dealing with really tangible things like vehicles in this example, but you can apply this type of thinking for the classes you're building to think about the individual pieces that you want your class to be made of. So let's pull these over to the side and talk about the different things that might make up each of these vehicles. We could have something like a chassis, and we already discussed engine, wheels, tires, and doors. Of course, in real life, these are composed of way more things, but for this example, we don't have to go define all of them. Even the engine or the motor in this example would be incredibly complex if we were to look at it from a composition perspective. So completely inverted from our inheritance diagram, when we're talking about composition, this is how I would like you to think about it. We're going to take each of the individual components that make up something like a vehicle and pass in implementations of those things into a vehicle class. Again, that means that we're not inheriting from vehicle and creating a motorcycle, a truck, or a car but instead we're going to be passing in different implementations of these different things that I've captured in this square box into the vehicle class. So if we were to create a vehicle that was supposed to be a motorcycle, what types of implementations of these different components would we be passing in to make a vehicle? Well, we said earlier that a motorcycle does not have doors. So we would pass in for our list of doors, there would be zero, or we could have a door implementation that was something like no doors. So if we're considering the wheels for a motorcycle, we would be looking at different properties, especially compared to a truck or a car. The first thing that we would be calling out is that there's only two wheels for a motorcycle. For each of these wheels, we might have properties such as the diameter and the width of the wheels. And if you were to contrast those with the properties of the wheels for a truck and a car, these wheels would likely be much smaller both in diameter and width compared to a truck and a car. Now a very similar example would be the tires, right? Because if there's only two wheels for a motorcycle, there's only going to be two tires. And of course, if the wheels are much smaller, then the tires are likely going to be much smaller as well when we compare them with a truck and a car. How about the engine for a motorcycle? The implementation of an engine for a motorcycle would look dramatically different from a truck and a car. For example, if the engine had properties on it such as the number of cylinders or the displacement of the engine, a truck might arguably have the largest displacement and the most cylinders, and maybe a car would be second to that, whereas a motorcycle would have far less displacement and fewer cylinders compared to both. Now, for those of you with really crazy motorcycles, yes, I realize this might not always be true, but this is just an example, and realistically, this is probably going to hold true. If we consider the chassis for something like a motorcycle, of course, this is going to look dramatically different from a truck and a car. Perhaps our chassis would have properties such as the material that it's composed of, the weight of the chassis, and the chassis might even define some dimensions that it has or points where we could mount these other components to. So you've done a great job with putting up with my terrible diagramming so far, so I figure you probably want to see a little bit of code even if you're not totally familiar with the language I'm going to use. It's probably helpful to see some of these concepts taken from diagrams and real world examples and translated into something like code just so you can see what it's going to look like. So I'll show you that in C Sharp. All right, so I'm here in Visual Studio and I have a simple vehicle record that I've created. And I'm just going to be using a record here to keep things simple and then I can print things to the console and you can see how it all works. I've omitted a couple of the components we talked about just to keep this more straightforward. And I've introduced an engine with an iEngine interface, 
doors as an array of iDoor interface, and then wheels as an array of iWheel interface. If you're not familiar with what an interface is, this is just going to define the functionality that we expect to have for each of these three different things. So let's go ahead and start with the iDoor interface. You can see that we've defined functionality to check whether or not the door is open or if it's locked. That's going to be these two properties here. And then I've also made methods so that we can open, close, lock, and unlock the door here. Just to keep things super simple, the iEngine interface will have a number of cylinders and then a displacement on it as well. I've made it a string just so that we can print things out a little bit easier and have them be more visible. And finally, the iWheel interface is just going to have a width and diameter on it. So now that we've looked at that, how do we go make an instance of a vehicle that would resemble a motorcycle versus a truck? So aside from our vehicle, everything that we've looked at so far is an interface, and that's going to mean that we need other records or classes to implement these interfaces so that we can go construct a vehicle. If we start with something like the engine, I just wanted to show you two different ways that you could go about this. We could have something like a generic engine that takes in arguments for the number of cylinders and the displacement so that we don't need to go make a unique implementation of this type. This would mean that for a motorcycle I could go make a generic engine instance I could pass in it that it has two cylinders and a small displacement. On the other hand what you could do is you could also make a very specific implementation that has our iEngine interface and then has very explicit properties defined for it. Now the example that I'm using is a little bit contrived just because we're going to be dealing with some really simple properties to print to the screen but there's going to be situations in your code where you may in fact want to have very specific implementations like this especially when it comes to functions and methods and there may be other situations where you want something more like this just so that you can have a really easy way to create these instances. Now when it comes time to actually create an instance of a motorcycle we would just be creating a new instance of a vehicle and then passing in the different objects that we want to make up that vehicle. In our example we could go make a generic engine pass in two for the number of cylinders and then we could say that we have a really big powerful motorcycle that has a 1000 cc motor. But what about the doors and the wheels? Well the doors are kind of easy because we did say that motorcycles don't actually have doors, so we can pass in an empty array of I door and not actually have to have an implementation of any doors at all. And because we didn't actually have anything made for wheels yet, we could follow the same pattern that we use for the engine and create a generic wheel record. And then because it's an I wheel, we need to have a diameter and a width as well. Now, because I'm just kind of rushing this example, I didn't actually have units and things associated with these. So we can just kind of make up some numbers when we go to create this. If we go back to instantiating the motorcycle, we could create a new array of I wheel and then pass in two instances of wheels. This is because motorcycles, of course, have two wheels. Now for our motorcycle, we could actually pass in two very different wheels. In this example, we could have the first wheel, let's pretend this is the front wheel, it could be 16 inches in diameter and have a width of 6. Let's pretend this is 6 inches and to be honest, I actually don't know how wide motorcycle wheels are. If we had this second wheel to be the back wheel, perhaps it's actually a little bit smaller in diameter. We don't have the tires here, but maybe it's a thicker tire and the wheel itself is a little smaller and maybe it's three inches wider. So if you imagine this motorcycle, it's got a bigger, wider wheel in the back. And actually, now that we have all of these created, we actually have an instance of a motorcycle. Let's go ahead and print our motorcycle to the console to see what values it has. Now, pardon the crappy formatting here, but we can see that in the console, we have our vehicle record, the engine, is of type generic engine and you can see that we have two cylinders and we have a 1000 cc displacement as well. The doors, we actually don't have any doors so that's totally expected and wheels actually didn't end up printing out the wheels that we wanted to see here. Now this is just because the string formatting for the record type so let's cheat a little bit and print out the first wheel we have and the last wheel we have in our array. And there we go. So of course this part did not change from when we previously looked at it but you can see that I'm printing out the first wheel and the second wheel. So coming back to composition you can see that we actually made a vehicle 
that has nothing to do with the type motorcycle, car, or truck, but instead the individual pieces that we passed in when creating our vehicle actually make up the things that make a motorcycle. Super quickly, let's repeat this for a truck. Now when we're going to make a truck, we can actually go, if we wanted to, swap to using Nick's unique truck engine that I made below. We can still use the generic one if we wanted to and just make it have a larger displacement and more cylinders, but let's try it out with this implementation. We're gonna have to come back to doors because we never actually made these. And for the wheels, instead of just having two, we can make four that are significantly larger. Let's go look at what we can do for eye door. So we can get a little bit more creative with this implementation of a door compared to some of the other interfaces because we actually have some methods to work with and some state. Now a truck is going to have four doors and have the methods close, lock, open, and unlock as well. And you'll notice that each of these is pretty simple except open actually has some interesting behavior. Because we can have a locked and unlocked state, we want to make sure that if we try to open the door when it's locked, that it should not work. And of course, I caught a bug, so let's put a return statement here so that we don't actually open the door after we say that we can't open the door. So now that we have generic door, let's go add four of them for our truck. If we go ahead and run this, we can see that we still have vehicle information being printed to the console, but it's a very different type of vehicle. Now, our engine is Nick's unique truck engine, and we can see that it has eight cylinders and a displacement of 10 liters. This is way bigger than the motorcycle. Now, doors and wheels did not print, again, because this is due to how the record type prints out with arrays. But we can actually jump back to the code and see if we can play with the doors and see how they work using our truck. Let's add some console write lines to see the state of our door for our truck. And we'll assume that the first door in our array, and we'll assume that the first door in our array is the driver's door in the front. So to start, the driver door is not open and the driver door is not locked. What we can try to do in code is actually open up that driver's side door and then see if it actually opened up afterwards. And if we look at the output here, we can still see that it starts off as false and false, and then after calling open on the door, we are able to see that the state of it is now set to open as true here. Let's go back to the code and actually try to lock the door before we open it and see what happens when we run this program now. You can see in the console that we actually see this line, the door is locked, and afterwards the door is not open and the locked state is set to true. So in fact, because we locked the door, we weren't able to open it. Now, because this is a talk on composition, if you wanted to change the behavior of how this door worked, you don't actually have to go change anything about the vehicle class at all. Instead, you could go implement your own implementation of iDoor and handle these things completely different. Perhaps if the door was locked and you tried to open it, you wanted to raise an alarm. What would that look like? Well, just to make this super quick, we could go make a whole new implementation called Alarm Door that would largely be the same as what we had before, but instead we could go make the console printing just print out something a little bit different. And if we look at our truck implementation, if we wanted to have alarm doors only in the front of the car, then we could go ahead and change these first ones just to be alarm doors. Now I'm just going to be a little bit lazy here and assume that the last door in the array is the passenger side rear door, and like we've been doing so far, the first door in the array is the driver's side front door. So if we try to lock it, then open it, and do the same thing in the rear, what would happen? Well, the first line we get in the console is loud alarm blaring, and that's because we have an alarm door that we were able to compose our vehicle with as the first two doors in the array. The second two doors are just the standard generic doors and they just print out that the door is locked when we try to open them and they're locked. So hopefully you found this explanation of composition useful. We started by talking about some key points for composition over inheritance and then started navigating some layouts to see how composition actually looks compared to inheritance. We use the example of vehicles because I think vehicles work really well when we can think about the different parts that go into each type of vehicle that we want to talk about. From there, we looked at a code example where we could actually change the implementation and functionality of the different parts in our vehicle to make different vehicles. And the cool part about this is we never had to go make a dedicated motorcycle class, a dedicated truck class, we never had to go override properties. Instead, we could go make purpose-built classes and go make a more complex object out of these classes. And because you watch right to the end, I did mention early on that if you're a more junior software engineer, that I have a skill that you should focus on early in your software engineering journey. 
So now that you understand composition, you can go learn about this other skill over here.